it's yeah, it should all be short. Thank you very much. Um, I know that this is not a sequencing program, but I am going to give a slightly sequencing centric um, presentation for the transitions of care. I also did speak with um, some of the PIs, the clinical PIs, so I'll be able to uh, share some perspective on how they feel um, on the ongoing um, evaluation of patients. So uh, we've discussed this um, um, already several times this morning, but uh, this is just um, a list of how the UDN evaluation um, progresses. And uh, just to um, put some um, points on the sequencing, um, the sites are able to choose between exome or genome sequencing, and as Brendan um, talked about in his example, there are some cases for which exome might be more appropriate, such as you're, if you're looking for really deep sequencing, perhaps because mosaicism might be a mechanism, or if you're looking perhaps for structural variants, in which case you might choose a genome. And as um, other people have discussed, a lot of patients are already coming to a center with an exome, so in that case, you might want to choose a genome. Um, we are um, encouraging trios or quads. Um, of course, this is not always possible with families, but um, if it is, we are um, um, trying to get as many family members um, as possible in a trio or a quad uh, type of arrangement. Um, the interpretation is being done by both the sequencing core, and that tends to be more of a clinical evaluation. So um, these are done by clinical laboratories with um, certain standards of, of clinical interpretation. Um, it's also being, uh, the raw data is being delivered to the clinical sites, and as Brendan also um, illustrated, these sites are able to go in with a deeper look, and perhaps with a look that is slightly more focused on the phenotype um, that they have observed in the patient or um, um, are, are um, in the process of evaluating. Also, all the results um, that are reported back to patients for clinical care are validated by another method, and currently this is Sanger validation. Um, then, of course, there are special studies that are available to network participants um, in the form of metabolomics, um, model organism studies, and functional studies. So what happens when an initial UD, UD, UDN evaluation is complete? Um, the sites um, are planning to provide a detailed visit summary to the family and the referring physician. Um, and then in the future, while the UDN may not be the primary source of ongoing care, of course, a relationship has been established between the UDN and the patient, and recontact with new findings should be facilitated. And I think that's one of the things we're going to be discussing. How does this um, recontact, in what form um, is this going to take, and how often, and under what circumstances? The evaluation, of course, is never truly complete. Um, there are a couple of dis different scenarios that we need to consider. Um, one is that the diagnosis is established at a UDN visit. But as was mentioned before, this is likely to be a rare or ultra-rare uh, diagnosis. And as such, the UDN may play an important role in determining or studying what management um, approaches um, are most appropriate for this patient and documenting that for future patients. Uh, the UDN may also play an important role in describing the phenotype. Um, and so we can see that there is going to be ongoing um, interaction between the UDN and uh, patients. Um, in the second uh, case, where the diagnosis is not established at the UDN visit, of course, this uh, leaves a lot of room for future opportunities for uh, contact. Um, further studies by the UDN core, um, reanalysis of sequence data, and I'll show you some examples of where reanalysis um, has been important um, in um, increasing the diagnostic rate. Um, and then there'll be new gene discoveries outside of the UDN, which can then be brought to bear on UDN patients. And then the UDN uh, creates a very uh, novel environment for discovery within our network. So reanalysis of sequence data um, is important because analytical tools um, are advancing, and uh, with these improvements, uh, they um, enable us to um, look at areas that perhaps were not looked at during the first pass of the sequence analysis. Of course, there's also impro improved curation of variants, and as um, patients become identified with certain variants, this information uh, then um, comes to bear on new patients. 
Uh, we may um, get additional information from family members that was not available at the time of initial uh, sequence um, interpretation. The affected status of a member of the trio or quad could change, maybe from affected to unaffected, and that, of course, will um, influence the interpretation. Um, but all of those types of things really um, pale in comparison to new gene discovery, and this is really the largest driver of increased diagnosis rate over time. And I'll show you some examples in our clinical laboratory of um, how this really impacts. So this was a presentation uh, recently given at the um, American College of Medical Genetics from um, our group at Baylor. And if you look at the um, almost 6,000 um, exomes um, that we've performed since 2013, um, and I should back off by saying we do mostly proband only, so not trios at the time, but proband only um, exome analysis. And this is all done on a clinical basis. Um, those that were solved in the first uh, pass of clinical interpretation is about 25 percent. But then as you um, perform reanalysis, we've been able to make additional diagnoses in about an additional 5 percent. And this is driven really by new gene discovery being 62 percent. If you take a look at two co cohorts that we published, uh, the first was in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was our first 250 cases. Uh, we had a diagnostic rate at that time, and it was published in 2013, of 25 percent um, for those initial 250 cases. Um, re with reanalysis over um, the subsequent three years, approximately, we've increased that diagnostic rate by 11 percent. So it's really, again, driven in, um, in the teal co color by new gene discovery. Um, if you look at the subsequent um, uh, study that we published in JAMA, and this is about 2,000 cases, that diagnostic rate initially was 25 percent, and over time it's increased to 30 percent. So I think this is um, a concrete, two concrete examples of how we will continue to make new diagnoses in the network and how important it's going to be to be able to maintain contact with these patients. So there are multiple ways that um, new gene discovery can be facilitated within the UDN. Um, first is continued phenotype and variant mining, um, then reaching out to um, services such as Matchmaker, either um, within the UDN perhaps, or collaboration with outside projects such as the CMG or the Mendelian project, and uh, the more uh, global Matchmaker um, um, tool. What are some of the challenges and opportunities? Um, speaking from the perspective of, of a clinical lab, we don't um, have a fully automated process for knowing when new gene discoveries are made. Um, we get this data by mining PubMed, by um, looking for when OMIM is um, updated, but it, there's not um, a fully automated alert system for when there's a new gene uh, discovered. Then querying our database and identifying those patients who have variants in the targeted genes, we need an automated process for doing this. And then having an efficient patient and physician recontact procedure. Um, again, within the UDN, I think this is something that is uh, definitely attainable. But as we look um, towards the future and making this more of a generalizable approach, um, we lose contact with patients, patients lose contact with physicians, and sometimes this information is going to be lost. And so we know that um, perhaps up to 10 percent new diagnoses can be made. This is a, a problem that we're all going to have to, um, to consider. So um, that's the UDN perspective, and I think uh, we can move on to the next talk. Thank you.